Aristotle would say what makes us different from the brutes is our reason. The very fact of using our reason and of pursuing the potential that our reason has is in accord with our human nature. So Martin's over here saying it's a bad attitude to say, I'm done reading, I'm good. I would say it's a bad attitude because it's contrary to our nature. Welcome to Classical Etc. You're in the studio with Memoria Press. Welcome to another edition of Classical Etc. Martin is here, Tanya is here, Paul is here, and I am here. My name is Stephanie Crosby, and uh, I'm guest hosting today. So we'll see how that goes. But um, and what I'm do a you long do? Time, yeah, I'm a listener. First of first of all, I'm a listener to Classical Etc. But I also have four children here at Highlands Latin School. Um, I'm a new teacher of literature in the high school here. Um, I'm a Memoria College student. And it's the best thing about her, I think. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's the whole package. Yes. Mm-hmm. When our friends at Memoria Press um, talked to me about maybe guest hosting here, I thought, when I walked away, I thought, I would love to be a fly on the wall when they say my name to Martin Cothran because he's going to say, the the woman who took my classical education seminars, both of them this summer, and never said a word. <laughs> <laughs> you never said a word. Oh, I I maybe chimed in once, but I think that was because uh, because I talk a lot in my literature. I'm right now. I'm taking the Christian epic course, which has been amazing. Um, and I did the British literature course, and I talk a lot in those. But I think it was because that was during the summer, and my children. We're, they were just home all the time. <laughs> and by the time it was time to sit down and, and take Mother Martin's uh, classes, I just, I had no more words left. And it was, <laughs> I just was letting the That's information right. How come old are in. your children? So I have a 13 year old boy and then three daughters, 11, nine, and six. Okay. So, and when so I, they're all over the place yes, here. Yes. And when I do um, open houses here at HLS and I say that to other parents, they usually say, oh, wow, you you must really love it here. <laughs> yes, that's the evidence. I have four children all enrolled all here, here um, at Highlands Latin School. And we and the other thing I tell them in open houses is we just love it more every year. Mm. The, the more we get into it, the more we love it. And the more I have come to realize um, my jealousy over their education and have started the process of you know, claiming that for mm-hmm. my own through all these different things we're going to talk about today, which leads us to our topic for today, which is lifelong learning. So we're going to talk about why we should be lifelong learners, how we go about doing that and cultivating it um, in a in a classical and responsible sort of way. But first, we're going to talk about <laughs> what we're reading. Paul, why don't you start us? Um, I, I started and I've, I've, stopped and I need to restart angle of repose by Walt Wallace Stegner. Oh, and I need to reread that. I, I started listening to it. I feel like it maybe is a book I need to sit down and read. Mm. Um, and then I was recently on a road trip. And so my wife and I were looking for a book and typically we just want something to pass the time, not some, you know, high quality novel. <laughs> Uh, and so I ended up listening to a Sue Grafton novel, which oh, I hate admitting, but you know, entertaining, total, just pure, pure She's like A is for something, B is for, yeah, C is A for, is for alibi, B is for burglar, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And she wrote 25 of them and died before she got to Z. Mm-hmm. It was, it's a little sad, but also yes. it's just, it's just entertainment. It's pure. It's, there's nothing redeemable about it. Um, other than passing the time when you're just mindlessly driving to Wisconsin. Um, See, if she had been Dorothy Sayers, she could have had her, like her student finish her commentary of the Divine Comedy or something like apparently that. Apparently, I guess the Sue family didn't have that. asked oh. that the publisher not allow anybody to write Z as for, uh, they, they did not want that done. They mm. didn't want anybody else to do it. Yeah. Um, but then I read a couple of Graham Greene short stories. <laughs> uh, and it, you know, then I'm like, all right, now I'm back in my mode. Yes, your you know? brain, I like your mode. reset button. That was yes. nice. Yes, short stories are the way to go. Get your reset. I then. don't. I'm not a big short story fan because <clears throat> I like, I like the. I just want to immerse myself in these characters' lives for a long, long time. Maybe that's why I love mm. Dickens because they're all <laughs> so long. <laughs> I like. Lo- yeah, that's interesting because I don't read a lot of short stories. But I love teaching them you know, oh, because right. there's, there's such compact little 
packages that you can teach a whole thing. Right. I like reading them because if I don't, if I know I don't have a whole lot of time, then I know I can get through something mm-hmm. and uh, and get a totality of something, something for me to chew on. Mm-hmm. And they're great for discussions. Uh, yes. The, you know, people don't have to read a whole bunch of stuff and you can get together and again, discuss mm-hmm. the whole thing yeah. in one, mm-hmm. one session. I have found I will sometimes treat um, James Harriet books that way because those chapters almost feel like, like short alone. stories. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you can just kind of dip in. And then I found that with some of the Wendell Berry short stories too. Like these are characters mm-hmm. that you, you know them, but you don't need to read like the entire, you don't need to read Great That's Expectations. Right. Mm-hmm. You can just kind of dip into a chapter here or there and revisit the characters you know and love and the storytelling that yes. you love. And, but his are because they are the same characters, mm-hmm. the same place always. To me, they don't feel, they feel more like I am immersed in the characters. Mm-hmm. So I don't struggle. But like Flannery O'Connor, where they're, every short story is a whole different mm-hmm. setting, a whole different set of characters. That, to me, is a lot more work. You have to reorient yourself every, every time. Every single yeah. time. Every single story. It I also love seems her like books. But. Like short stories are not as popular now as they used to be, which is kind of surprising to me because I would think a sh- the shorter things would be more popular now because of you know all the things we've our shortened uh, attention good, spans. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was thinking about that too. Because, but I was thinking that, and and I don't know if I'm right about this, but I just have this general impression that short stories were generally published in like periodicals or magazines. Yes, and there's not as many, and magazines. there's not as many of those People going read on. Mm-hmm. Magazines. Good that's point. a good point. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. absolutely. Hmm. As opposed to, and, but Dickens was in. You know, those were well, published they were in serialized. Yeah. Serialized. Yeah. yeah, you had to wait for your next. <laughs> right. and, and there's none of that. I don't do they do no. that at all? No. Anymore. Well, no, because no, there's no really yeah. good. Mac newspapers. I'm, I might have gotten through more Dickens if I was given a chapter. A serial. Of right. Well, that's yeah. probably right. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Martin, what have you been reading? Uh, well, I am reading. <clears throat> I've been looking around for a book that um, deals with the Middle Eastern situation that that's going on right oh. now, and I've been really having a real trouble finding one. And I tried several, you know, and I'm just aud- from Audible. And a lot of them, like they were, there were false statements from just factual historical false statements from the very beginning of some of these books. And I thought, what in the world? So I went back and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the author, but there's a book called The Peace to End All Peace. And it's about the event which produced the modern Middle East, which was the fall of the Ottoman Empire. You know, people, everyone's talking about homelands and my, this is my homeland. Okay. No, before before you had any nation there, uh, the Ottoman Empire ran it. It's only been run by somebody else. There's no there's no nations as we think of them here. And this this talks about when you know the uh, pretty you know mostly the British came in and and drew all those lines there that are the borders now, which have very little to do with who's where. And it wouldn't matter anyway because there's all kinds of factions. There's a thousand factions of different people. So, and trying to make a nation out of uh, out of places that are not nations, and it's just fascinating. So it goes back to the very beginning of this. Mm. It doesn't talk about the stuff in between. It tells you how this whole thing was formed and it explains all the stuff that happens after. So it's a very very interesting historical book. Does it go back far enough to sort of make that case, or does it start with? that presumption that that is the main event and then goes from there. No, it's, it's, it talks about the, the, Mm -hmm. the the situation in, you know, before and after world war one in particular. Mm. And it was interesting because, (laughs) you know, I think you think of Churchill as being a world war two figure. And the, the author says, as he's setting all this up and he says, there's one figure who figure who looms behind this entire story. And it's a figure of Winston Churchill. And so mm-hmm. he plays a very primary because people don't think about what Churchill was doing before, before World War II. Mm-hmm. And he was doing mm-hmm. a lot yes. before he was chancellor of the Admiralty when he was 36 years old, um, this sort of thing. So it's a, it's a fascinating historical account. I love history because history is a story, right? Uh, now, I read, I mentioned I'd read Resurrection Walk, the, my sort of, your, the equivalent of the one you, you mentioned that. Uh, oh, just pure entertainment? Tanya, uh, frowned at. Yeah, yes. just uh, I've listened to Resurrection Walk uh, by um, Michael Connolly. Um, got done with that. I went back to the um, Three Musketeers. 
Oh. No, no, we're going. We finished that. He finished yeah. it. Uh, All right. So I'm hoping you start. As they 20 say, years this later. part of the country got shut of it. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and uh, the the is it Joe Pickett? The Joe Pickett novel by C.J. Bach. Oh yeah. yes. Now, now aren't those like? Are, is there something Pure entertainment. Su- Pure supernatural entertainment. in those no. though, no, 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 or no. goes back in time? No. Or? You know who they remind me of, and it's also the same reader on Audible, is William Kent Kruger's... Um, oh, I like his books. What are, uh, yeah, you've read a couple of those. Mm-hmm. There's a series, and I'm With blanking. With Cork. Cork is, O'Connor, the Cork mm-hmm. O'Connor series. Very, very much like that. Uh, so I've been doing that. And then I, I mentioned, I think last time, that I was starting on Death uh, Comes for the Archbishop. Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. And then I, I'm just, I had to get a new new version of it because the reader was not... Southern? No, um, no, he couldn't Midwestern. do the accents. You need, you need to do, mm, in the beginning, that. you need to do some French, and you need to pronounce French terms in the way a French person would say them and not in the way an American would say them. Uh, so you that know, was the, problem. the reader is so important. It, it is, uh, it is One time important. I accidentally got a Jeeves book read by an American. <laughs> I didn't, Are you serious? I mean, I lasted 10 minutes. Yeah, That's absolutely. just impossible. I, no. I just put down a book called Thunderstruck, um, which the storyline was fascinating, but the reader was horrible. I mean, I got, mm. I, was was power I, I caution down. people about that all the time. When I give talks, you know, do not, uh, listen to a book that is not well read because it will ruin the book. It will ruin the book. So you get just dump it as soon as you can. What would you say is the percentage of your, your book consumption that is audio book? Mine very, very little. Uh-huh. I don't, I, I read, yeah. I don't listen to audiobooks much be, not because i i mean i i have a pretty good commute every day i could get quite a bit read but i just don't i don't um i don't get i i wander i can't stay mm-hmm. focused like i can on an on actual printed words i think that's just a some kind of processing mm-hmm. problem i have but I will read like um, like War and Peace. I will listen to some of it, and then I'll go back and reread, like just skim through the thing the things that I feel like I didn't get. Mm. So I would never do an audio book just by itself. Maybe Sue Grafton, I could. Yeah, yeah, you could do Sue Grafton. But for an an actual book that I need to pay attention to, yeah. I would not. Jeeves. I can do uh, Jeeves by audio. Yeah, yeah. My percentage is very low. Mine is very high. I okay. do most of it in audiobook because, I, I, you know, if I'm out clearing fence lines or whatever, mm-hmm. I can be reading. Yeah. Mine's probably about half and half, maybe two-thirds audio, but I live closer now. I used to be. I drove in on mm-hmm. a very long mm-hmm. drive, so most, the vast majority of my reading was listening. Mm-hmm. But I, I tend, I, I can't, I can only listen to narrative fiction. Um, mm, right. I, I, if I have a, a, a book nonfiction you need to mark book, in. Yeah, yeah, I have to mark in it. Yeah. And, I, and it frustrates me if I'm thinking, here's something just went by that I want to, mm-hmm. to, to be able to go back to, and I can't. And then right. yeah. They do have bookmarks. It's a but, bookmark button. But you know what? I've done bookmarks forever, <laughs> and I don't know that I've gone back to any. Yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's so difficult. Yeah, so that I was just talking with another teacher about this this morning because she was talking about audiobooks. And I said, I just, I've tried. I can't do them. I think I may be similar to you, Tanya, in that like my mind will just wander if I'm on an audiobook. Right. Maybe I should try different genres and see if that has oh, something yeah. well, to do I mean, with I it. I do listen to podcasts too. But yeah, I think you, um, listening is a skill. Mm. And it's a skill, mm-hmm. and you you have to learn a skill. Well, and I just I find myself, and this is what I told her too. I just I miss the underlining. Maybe the underlining and the marking and all that is part yes. of my process in reading. Because mm. as I'm mm. listening, I think, oh, now I have to go find that page right. so I can underline that. And then and then the teacher I was talking with, she said, "Well, do you go back and read your underlined things?" <laughs> and I said, "Sometimes, sometimes I do, yes. but sometimes, sometimes it just aids in the current." reading yeah. but sometimes i will say oh wait uh th- this has something to do with you know something three chapters ago so i think well, it's I a, a mixture of those i have a commonplace book where i put quotes mm. but mm. i'm just not disciplined from about audio it. I books to, to go back yes and find and i need to like the end of the day i need to i need to just you know oh when do you find that down, time though i know right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sit down I, and say go go over your things and make sure you I, when i've read a a book that is not like 
a British murder mystery that is my enjoyment reading, but a book that I've that I've marked in, mm-hmm. then when I finish it, I go back and reread everything I marked. It, that gives me another wow. like overview. Well, it's not hard to do. Well, like I just am in the middle of doing that now with um, David Copperfield, and it. I mean, you have to flip through every page again, Mm -hmm. but then, but then just whatever. And I, sometimes I think, why did I underline that? And, and then other times I think this is just really great. And then I'll write it in the commonplace book, Mm -hmm. my body Mm makeum. But um, I think I have spent so many years now blocking Martin out that maybe it's affected my ability to comprehend (laughs) Audible. <laughs> I totally don't understand what she just said. I, I will she say. She blocked it out. <laughs> I will say that I learned the skill of listening at the boarding school because like mm-hmm. during meals, you would have yeah. one person reading a book and no matter what you were doing, whether you were fighting with the guy next to you trying to get some dessert or whether you were serving tables or clearing somebody tables or whatever, was reading somebody was reading, you were trying to listen because if you, if, because if, and, and you learned that if you missed something, if you paid attention enough, you could figure out through context, probably mm. the important parts of what you missed. Mm. And so, you know, that's shame was all about. If I, if I skip it, I rewind it. If I, if I, mm, you know, and right. I'm like, I don't, I, I don't do that unless I can tell it's a very massive part because I've just been trained to be able to fill in those gaps. Right, but there are some key parts. I just remember doing that the other day and just there's that yeah. little, and Audible has that backwards 30 seconds button, mm-hmm. which is great. Yeah. And then if you if it's just something little and short, then you can just pre- press it forward 30 seconds mm-hmm. and you're yes. back where you were. No. But no, I, there are certain things that you do want to listen to more carefully and you realize you were just zoning for about mm-hmm. a minute. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Back. Real quick. So you mentioned going back over David Copperfield for your underlines. Does that mean that you have finished David Copperfield? I finished David Copperfield and I'm about, I've got 200 pages left in Demon Copperhead. So it is an amazing experiment. I would highly recommend it, but have you read Demon this Copperhead? Is Barbara King's all yes. Yes. Okay. I have not read it. Okay. I have read David Copperfield, well, but not. So David Copperfield is just, it has gone to the top of my Dickens list. Yes. But Demon Copperhead, I mean, I think what she has done, and I just found out she won the Pulitzer for this book. I think what she has done is really brilliant. Mm. Her character names, the plot from going from the David Copperfield plot, which anybody can imagine if you've read any Dickens, to Appalachia and the drug problem and um, lack of education, her the social justice there is um, the coal mines controlling everything, closing down no other industry. It's all in there in the way that Dickens wrote about his own social justice issues. Mm. But, so would you recommend it? Not, I read let one me, King's I want to finish I like it. it so. um, I do like her novels, but um, it's, it's raw. It's got more... Um, you know, more, I'm not really a big fan of coming of age novels. And so I didn't even, I didn't know if I would like it, but I just did this as an experiment because I, I do like Barbara King Solver's novels and, and I did, I was really interested in how, if she could pull this off. I think the, the narrator in David Copperfield is an adult writing back. A, a wise, mature adult writing back in this book so far. I'm really anxious to see how she, how, where she ends it. But at this point, it really is like you're, like a teenager is writing it. And not, I think that is the, my problem with it. But I think what she's done is in some ways brilliant too. Well, isn't think, it interesting I just how need a to different finish perspective it. will color a story, you know, if you're listening to Dickens going and he's talking about it from mm. his later age, uh, it's that's that's so utterly different than being in the mind of the character, right? Which and, is where King Solvers got me. Is I'm just I feel like you know I'm it's being written 
by a 15 year old. Yeah, I don't think I can about handle being 15 mind year old for more boy than about things. Five well, yeah, it's real. It's, you know, there's drug use and mm-hmm. alcohol, you know, kids just, I don't know. But that makes me think she must have made that decision. There has to be yes. a purpose behind that. I'll well, be interested to hear yes, as you I come to, to the end it. if you can look back on it and say, I see what she was doing. Yes. Because at this point, I don't know. Because that's not an accident. Like choosing your narrator like that is not an accident or like a flippant decision that an author makes. Especially because she was basing it on this particular book and did everything is so beautifully paralleled. But but it's her own story. It is her Mm. own story. It's not just sticking David Copperfield in the 21st century. But her character, you know how Dickens character names are Mm -hmm. so Wonderful. So the character in David Copperfield, Steerforth. Mm. So mm-hmm. yeah. in this book, he's um, fast forward. His name is fast forward? <laughs> yes. And then in Dickens, Uriah Heep, in her book is U-Haul. <laughs> You're making um, me want to read it just with the names. I mean, it's ama- it really is amazing. Yeah. And the storyline, the characterizations of the characters are the same. But this is another example of this modern flight from the omniscient narrator. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. We, it's like we don't like to do that anymore because that's a God's eye view. Mm. And we don't want to put that in things anymore. And so we we put the consciousness of the story in the character or right. even in Dickens, you know, the, him later, David Copperfield in later life. But it's like you go to Tolstoy or something like that and it's it's omniscient narrator. It's, mm-hmm. it's the God's eye view. And I, I have a preference for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's ultimately the best way to tell a story. Right. Well, definitely let us know. I when will. You get to oh, the I end, will. Because I'll the still be reading narrator. it when we do this again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So, what are you reading besides yeah. what? I mean, are you reading besides Weathering Heights I, and your college I class? I have three tracks of reading. Uh, I'm reading Weathering Heights. This is my sixth read through as I'm teaching it along. So, my book is. Hold on, well six, worn. six to read through in your life or six to read through in like my in the past life. year? In okay. my life. Maybe okay. this is the third read through in the past year. Um, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to live up to, you know, the, the expert teacher who is also at the upper school and <laughs> try to, try to teach alongside that. And mm-hmm. I wanted to be ready for that challenge. Mm-hmm. So well, I think that's I'm reading. Yeah, you kind of have to read through and then you have to yes. go back and then it's you like have to read with the students. Back to your underlines, right? Yes. Yeah. And then I'm reading Paradise Lost with my Christian Epic mm-hmm. class. Um, and then my sort of for fun book that I started over Thanksgiving is called Mariner and um, is by Malcolm Geet. And it is about Samuel Taylor Coleridge oh. and uh, the rhyme of the ancient Mariner. And I was hesitant. It was recommended to me by another literature teacher in the upper school. And I was hesitant because generally speaking, we don't, we don't like to look at the biography of the author and let that inform how we're reading the text. We want to read the text for what it is on its own, its own art. I don't know that I'm, that's a Kyle Yonke thing. I don't well, really agree with him on that. I, I mean, like I the mean, perspective of the author. Sure. So it's, but does it, and and maybe it's that you read it after you've read the text. Yes. <laughs> but okay. So maybe could, not before, I could do that. Yes. but then after. Um, but this, the the look at this, I'm only about halfway through it, but um, it, it kind of gives some biography up until the writing of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And then the middle section of the book walks you through this huge poem and about how it relates to Coleridge's life as it kind of played mm-hmm. out later. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at, at what I think it's going to be later is sort of Coleridge looking back on his own life and saying, I didn't realize it at the time I wrote this poem, but I was writing about myself. Like oh, I wow. am, the art became my life and I didn't mean for my life to turn out this way, but I can see my life hmm. in this 
mm. masterpiece poem it that I wrote. Interesting. It's so great, and the way it's written. It, I mean, the poem is woven throughout the biography. It is so well written. Well, and that's a poem I I found hard to read, and so that probably makes it a whole lot easier mm. to read and understand. What do you that. What do you find hard to read about him? I don't remember. It was, it was many years ago. Oh, okay. I just remember kind of slogging through, not really understanding mm. it, which is, you know. Probably typical uh, of a first time sure. on something like that. Anyway, I remember. Yeah. I, remember back I would just, just remember came. enjoying it. I don't know why. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't know that. It, like when it was when I was exposed to it when I was younger, I just got a selection of it. But I just I remember just the like the imaginative nature of it enchanted me. Mm. Well, it comes, I think the reason it came up, it came recommended from the other teachers because I was teaching it to my 10th graders in the poetry mm-hmm. unit. And it comes at a really great moment because there's been, you know, you're in the romantic poets and there's a lot of, look at the flowers, look right. at the sky, <laughs> look at the grass, yeah. isn't it pretty? And then you get to this, you know, you get to, you know, the sea voyage and there are like corpses coming back to life and sailing the ship and there are sea, sea serpents writhing in the ocean. And, right. and, what is there know, not to like about that Martin. <laughs> I'm thinking this sounds like a guy. <laughs> I mean, it, it definitely gets the students' attention. Mm-hmm. You know, you've spent yeah. enough time gazing at flowers and hillsides, and then <laughs> right. all of a sudden right. people are you've got you a know, real story. Yeah, they're so thirsty, they're biting their own flesh mm-hmm. to drink their like to you know, part uh, water, water, part water, water, water like this and, when I was about 15 years I mean, old. Yeah, the the, the you read it too late in my <laughs> class. They were it had their attention for sure. So mm-hmm. I have been enjoying looking at it from sort of the author's perspective and how he saw his own life in that yeah. years after he wrote it. So um, I think that could be very helpful for poetry, especially. Yes. Well, what's interesting is our topic is lifelong learning, and this is very much why. We, well, we are learning. We're, we're, I mean, I, well, it, learning. I mean, right that's here. really what we do at the beginning of every show. We you know, talk about what we're reading, and it's it's th- talking about lifelong learning, mm-hmm. isn't it? I mean, how do you read? And different people do that in different ways, and mm-hmm. and uh, so I just yeah was thinking of that as we were talking here. Segway, Martin. Thank I you. I just yeah. There you go. You are you <laughs> take wanna, it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to before we talk about how we're reading. And I do want to revisit this topic of sort of reading for entertainment versus reading mm-hmm. for, you know, education or like pushing our minds, but like maybe even just back up a little bit from that and talk about why, like, why should we be lifelong learners? Mm-hmm. Uh, because mm-hmm. I know on a podcast like this, people who are listening to classical, et cetera, are probably, they are bought in for lifelong learning. But I know, I know people who would say something like, well, I did the reading that I needed to do in college mm-hmm. and I got my grades and now I'm I'm done. I'd like to check out on that. So and read British murder mysteries all the time. <laughs> Perfect. Or or <laughs> or do crossword puzzles or mm-hmm. something like that. So why? I mean, maybe just to practice articulating why we why we should pursue lifelong learning. Why is that a worthy goal? Well, a lot of this is attitudinal, I think, because I think a lot of people look at school. Mm-hmm. as a, a a place of drudgery that you have to get through to get a degree in order to do some professional thing. And that attitude's a bad attitude. And and I and but yet I vast majority of people look look at it that way. And so like so when when you graduate, the the time for having to read books is done and now you can go on and do interesting things. I think it's the attitude most people have. I think that's a really unhealthy cultural attitude and it is it is sort of it's 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 throughout the system i think of of school Mm. partly because you know there's not a whole lot of reading of books that's going on anymore if you ask around and so there is nobody's really cultivating that enjoyment of literature and really able to uh uh get kids into a book that that takes some time to do and and they've got you know test prep and they've got all these other things they're doing and all these other programs and they don't really have time for that anymore and that's making it even worse i mean it was bad enough when i was in school um in the in the uh, uh 60s and 70s and now now it's 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 much worse people just don't regard the reading of books as an enjoyable activity I, I would like to, rather than just bemoaning our state, point out <laughs> that uh, 
Aristotle would say what makes us different from the brutes is our reason. And I mean, this is something that I've just hammered into my students this year is the very fact of using our reason and of pursuing the, the potential that our reason has is in accord with our human nature. So Martin's over here saying it's a bad attitude to say, I'm done reading. I'm good. I would say it's a bad attitude because it's contrary to our nature. Our very nature is to be rational. <clears throat> and as such, and because we, we aren't born as perfectly rational beings, it is a skill that we, that we work on day in and day out and that we will never fully achieve. But that, that, I mean, that's part of our purpose. Our purpose is to know. And I, and I think it's the same thing that we tell our, I hope we tell our students. I don't know that we are telling them, but we're, um, when we talk about why classical education and we say, you know, that we're educating students so that they can be the best humans that they can be and so that they will be equipped to fulfill God's purpose for their lives. And and so we can't we don't just stop at a certain age. Mm. We still have to keep thinking about that. And and I think the more we read and the more we study, hopefully the wiser we become and hopefully we make fewer mistakes and we are fulfilling that purpose at least to some extent. Mm. And I think there's a there's a posture of humility in it too, to say I I'm never going to get to the point where I don't need I this. have all of right. this figured out and I'm just going to sit in my chair, you know, like just to, to come at knowledge with humility and say, I'm always ready for more. Yeah, I mean, if you're a reader, the problem is how am I going to get all the books read right. that I want uh, to read? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and yet we all know probably maybe most of our friends, I mean, who, that's not a concern of theirs at all. Their concern is that they may have to read one. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's such a dramatically different attitude about the importance of reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I think I've mentioned this before. The books that are in my basement are books that I have read and that I will keep, you know, and be able to go back and refer to mm -hmm. in, the, in the odd case that I do underline something in one of my books. Um, <laughs> but the the books upstairs which is by far the majority of them are the books i haven't read and it's just it's so pleasant to go to this bookshelf and go huh what do i want to read i've got theology and philosophy up there i've got history i've got literature i've got farming like what i cannot believe you're saying this what do i want if hey i had hey, the books hey are you trying to haunt me <laughs> Are you trying to haunt me about no. something I thought in my youth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if I had all the books I hadn't read yet on the on one floor, and underneath that the books I had read, the the, the top floor would collapse into the bottom floor because most vast majority of my books I have not read yet. But I've, yes, well, uh, that's what I'm have, saying. I, is I have I have much more that I haven't read than what I have. We just moved. There were yeah. probably 100 to 120 boxes of books. I believe that yes. because yes. because they all somehow end up. When your trunk gets full, mm -hmm. you have to move them out into yes. a box and then start again. Uh, yes, I have a, a, a bookmobile. Yeah. Yes, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't had the time to acquire that many books. <laughs> so, so how I do won't you tell the story? Uh, they've uh, oh, you have told it on this I've podcast not. before. Have I really? I'm sure you have. Is this haunting? Is this so. haunting? Yeah. When 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 Paul first started working for the publishing company Memoria Press, <laughs> I said something about books, and he. Um, he said he didn't have a bookcase because everything he needed was on his Kindle. Ooh. And he and saw Tony absolutely no. And we hired him. Need. All of the no, content just... I needed was on my Kindle. <laughs> that's exactly. All of the content mm -hmm. I needed. Not <laughs> everything I needed. No, oh. but that's, that, and it was. Then I bought a house. You were very young. Then I bought a house. Yes, and he filled it with books. Not an empty bookcase with a Kindle sitting on it. <laughs> Paul, can you explain how thankful you are to us about changing your attitude on things like this? <laughs> yes, Paul, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> how do you go, Tanya. Paul? You, how do you go from your bookshelves that are filled with books that are sorted by category, the way you described earlier, instead of on your Kindle? How do you, uh, along this line of staying well read, mm. 
how do you make that choice of where you're going next and when mm-hmm. to when to read for f- just purely mm-hmm. for fun and when to read to to grow your mind or to expand your horizons? How do you do that? So, um, since we're throwing jabs at one another, uh oh. <laughs> when when I when I came to Memorial Press, my diction was proper. I would say things like "I think" or uh, "I have decided." And then I started working next to Tanya, who always says, I feel like. Oh. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and so I. It's all about my feelings. <laughs> yes. uh, but I have internalized that. And it literally, it very much is mm. what strikes me in the moment mm. and what I'm excited about because th- there are things that are tough to read, you mm. know. Uh, I was uh, I was just telling students this because we're going through Arizona right now, book one of the physics. I'm like, guys, this is tough. Like, this is tough mm. for me. I know it's tough for you, you know. So, you know, hang with me here. Like, I'm trying to explain this and we're going to go over it again and again and again until you get it. But I know this is tough. So, you know, and reading the classics can be tough. So occasionally you need something that you just really enjoy, you know, go do that. Also, sometimes it's based on necessity. Sometimes I need to know what in the world I'm going to do out in the farm and I need to go read a book about that. Um, and, and, and I think part of that is, is just discernment about where you are at personally. So there've been times in my life where I've just, I have just, um, consumed philosophy and theology, philosophy and theology. And then I realized I need some fiction in my life Mm. and I've been reading fiction now for, I don't know, like five years and no philosophy and theology unless it's, unless it's for work. Yeah. For and work, so right? It's, it's. I mean, I still have a balance because my work forces me to be reading. That's various what I was things. going to say. Our work really mm. requires us to read mm-hmm. things that keep us disciplined to read good things. Yeah, and I, uh, I have a you know general plan, a, a general list of books that I want to have read before I die. But also, when I come, when it comes down to what I want to read, maybe outside of that, because I have several books going at a time. Um, it's casting of lots. I mean, mm. this mm-hmm. looks vaguely interesting. Let's try this and a ex- mm-hmm. little bit of experimentalism. And, and I think reading, um, in some, in some ways ought to be done in community in some ways. Right. So like that teacher, uh, recommending a book to you, mm. like that you can uh, then go back and talk to yeah, that teacher and, about, and, and, but you need to do that in a timely mm-hmm. fashion. Otherwise, because I've had people recommend me books and I'll put it on a list and I'll come back to it three years later and go, why in the world would I read this? And I don't remember who recommended it to me. So I've started to put names on who recommended what to me. But So you can go back and say, why did you recommend <laughs> yeah. five years later? Yeah, or say, I read this and now let's talk about it, you know. And so I think that also, you know, is is a it has to be a catalyst on what when you're going to read certain things is, hey, did I just talk to somebody about this? And so maybe I'll pick this one up next. <coughs> To be able to converse, because Tanya gave me War and Peace a year ago, and we didn't start it. I mean, I didn't start we it for just nine started months. It, yeah. yeah, and you hadn't read it before. I have read it before. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a must read. Been a while. Yeah, and a lot along the lines of what you said, Tanya, about our jobs kind of forcing us to stay well read. I mean, I think it was a comment that Martin made on on this very podcast. I don't know when months ago, just about if you really want to know something and know it well. There's no better way to do that than teaching it, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> which is definitely that's right. part of why I'm a literature teacher now, because I thought I can spend all the time thinking about this. But it is a different way of studying a book to know that you're going to be teaching that book. So, I mean, what other disciplines, you know, have you seen this in your own careers about um, really getting your arms around something or about lifelong learning um, based on what what needed to be taught. So what spot needed to be filled well, it, at wherever you're teaching. Yeah, cause, Cause you want, when you're reading something, you know, in one sense, you just want to let, let it flow over you. You know, you don't want to analyze it too much, but then if it's a really good book, you want to think back on it and that sort of thing. And, and I think what teaching does is it gives you an excuse to go back and reflect mm. on it. Uh, which is, which is why that's so valuable. I mean, a lot of what I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, well, the other thing is if you are, if you read syntopically as Mortimer Adler said, you read a lot of different books and it does allow you even without teaching 
to relate what you're reading now with the things that you have read before mm-hmm. in comparison and contrast with those things. It, it That kind of becomes natural to you if you're a, a strong reader. Um, but, uh, but I think teaching, that nothing really replaces teaching in no. terms of understanding what you are reading. But, but Martin, like you, didn't you learn Latin in order to teach it? Um, yes. Yeah. So there have been things where just absent, just reading a book where we've said, you know, I have to go learn that in order to teach it. You know, I mean, the, but, but the, te- the, the teaching was the learning really in, in that, uh, I think, I mean, you did, yes, you have to study it beforehand, but the very teaching of it is, Every is ingraining year, it in yes. you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So. You, it be, you become a master of the subject mm-hmm. after teaching it. Yes. After reading Wuthering Heights yes. six times I mean, I will, and uh-huh. actually trying to impart that book to right. a group so of students. It's, even, it's the learning of it, but then it's, to your point, I think, it's the interacting mm-hmm. with the students yes. about it and hearing yes. how they're reading it oh, as yes. well mm-hmm. and then and thinking, oh, you know, this this is the idea I want us to all be able to get our arms around by the end of this, but how do I corral all right. of that mm-hmm. into into one idea or one theme or the, you know, the, um, the threads that I want us to all be holding by the time we get to the end of this. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and one of the reasons that that works, not just for the teacher, but for the student is because you are discussing it. I mean, having a discussion group Mm. is so important Mm -hmm. in this. Uh, you know, we have various things that we do here with, with people at work, um, and, and also people outside work, uh, where we get together and we discuss something and that just really helps to fortify not only your knowledge of the book, but your appreciation for mm-hmm. what's in, in the book. Mm-hmm. And it and, also disciplines you to read it. Oh, to absolutely. Actually yes. get through yeah, it. I, right. I have read some philosophical texts because somebody has come up to us and said, I really want to read this book. Would you read it with me? And would we discuss it? And that's when we tend to have more regular discussions is where somebody has said, right. I want to read this book, but I can't read it alone. It's like mm-hmm. having an accountability partner. Well, uh, one, of, one of the people on our staff who will go nameless <laughs> uh, wanted to read the book this- Scaramouche by Raphael Sabatini because she saw that name in a Queen song. That's right. <laughs> That's Bohemian right. Rhapsody. But didn't and this we, was, it had nothing we, to do with the song. No, but we loved <laughs> reading know. it and yes. we had a great discussion about it. <laughs> That's the I worst reason for worked. reading something ever. But it, Everybody it loved purpose. it though. That was a great book. <laughs> but, and, but, but I, like even in that book, like I'm sure I missed so many references in that book because mm-hmm. it was so, it was, it was driven by References to theater, to French theater, uh, that I well, know I, I missed. Right, mm-hmm. I would have missed those but too. I, I just thought it would have been fascinating if I had known all those references. It would have been even more fascinating. Yeah. It, but if, th- that's always. The- but if we were putting together a list of things you can do to further um, uh, um, make your reading life profitable, one would be teaching, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And then the second would be discussing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. I, I just, I just think that we need to recommend yeah. to everybody on the show. If you are not in a discussion group, mm-hmm. you need to get in one or form, or one. just find a friend yeah. mm-hmm. that will read alongside yes. you right. and be and be that person that helps mm-hmm. you because self discipline is a part of it. Mm-hmm. Would yes. I? I mean, I literally could, if I didn't have the attitude that I need to continue learning, I could be happy reading British murder mysteries all the time. I mean, I could. And I would be happy for her to do that because then she'd leave me alone. (laughs) Do you think I would? Well, maybe I mean, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, the one other thing I will add that has helped with my own lifelong learning that has a lot of these elements that we're talking about, discussion, accountability, and there's even a writing element would be Mm -hmm. these Memoria College classes that I've been doing and the seminars that they have there. Um, I, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I have been jealous of my, of my kids' classical education and I've been looking for ways to, um, to try to get that for myself. I see the lack in my own education and have been looking for ways to enhance that. And, uh, it has been a tool that I didn't know I, I was missing, but it, it does, it has the accountability there. You, you have a certain reading schedule you have a class of people who are coming together at a certain time to talk about what you've read you have um 
a, a facilitator who knows a lot about the subject, but then you also have writing mm -hmm. that you're doing. And we all know that writing about something is thinking about mm -hmm. something. Um, and it adds a layer of, of depth um, that, and, and the writing is on a schedule too. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's tons mm -hmm. of accountability and tons of discipline if you're lacking that. And I certainly was, um, but I have enjoyed uh, the writing as much as mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. um, the discussion. So I think that's another element that you can add. And there, there are semester long courses there, but there are also seminars mm -hmm. um, that people seminars, can jump yeah. in on. Yeah. Um, usually on one book or one, uh, one particular issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and, and I would say like, I mean, I've, I've always kind of been down on the, why would I go back to school to read books that I can read on my own? Mm -hmm. But because I think largely the attitude in most universities today is that's you're going back for a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I right. think that that distinguishes Memorial college. Is it really like, uh, and I've, I've sat in on a couple of classes and I mean, the students are really there to have the discussion about the text yes. because they're enjoying the text. Mm -hmm. And can I just say Memoria college.org. Oh, thank you. Okay, so now now we've turned it into a commercial. So, I mean, I, I do think, you know, a way to kind of wrap this up is to say, yes, read and read well. Read for enjoyment, but also make sure that you're, you're pulling yourself out of those comfort categories that you have of reading, whether it's philosophy and theology or it's British murder mysteries, but <laughs> recognize your patterns, um, look for ways to stretch your brain, do it in community, do it with accountability and maybe add and a writing write. thing if you can. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, the writing is, is important. yeah. Is important. yeah. Um, so what other, is there any other advice that you would add to that for people who are listening to this and looking for ways that they can, I think Maybe I'm always the up. voice that says, start where you are, mm. that, you, that don't, you know, don't read Paradise Lost if you haven't read, I don't know, Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> you, mm. you know, don't, don't try, don't just decide I'm, I'm going to read Dante because I'm, I've listened to this podcast and, mm. and I need to be a lifelong learner. Start where you are so that you can be successful. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of great um, books out there. You don't have to start with a 900 page Dickens book, though I would recommend it. <laughs> and I would. But, all, but I would also say like the more you do it, the easier it gets. Absolutely. You know, and you so you become able to read and um, comprehend, mm -hmm. contemplate. Like I, like I have gotten to a point where I enjoy war and peace. First hundred pages hard. <laughs> You know, I liked the first hundred, not and, the second and, hundred. But now, like, it's enjoyable. It's not just, oh, it's a great book, so I have to read it. Hmm. And so, the more, like, at times, I say, right, start where you are, but you don't always have to have kind of in the back of your head, I'm on this lifelong learner journey, <laughs> but I, you know, I really want to be reading my British murder mysteries over here. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like, it builds um, up the muscles. You build it up does. the muscles. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And maybe at one point, you'll leave behind those British murder mysteries. Oh, no, don't make me do that. I, I would say memoriacollege.org. Oh, stop it. <laughs> where, where, Just, where we, do not, where we do not have on our reading list any British murder mystery. Okay, <laughs> would somebody turn his mic off? <laughs> you can read as many British murder mysteries as you want. Thank you, as long as I finish War and Peace, right? That's right. Well, thank you all. Great discussion. And thanks thank for you. having me with you. It was <laughs> fun. You. Thank you for watching this episode of Classical Etc. Please consider liking or sharing this video or commenting below to let us know what you thought. This has been Classical Etc. with Memoria Press. We'll see you next time.